Well, Sahar Aziz is a professor and director of the Center for Security, Race and Rights at Rutgers University's Law School. She joins us now live from Newark, New Jersey, in the United States. Good to have you with us. So it's not only in Israel, is it, that there have been complaints about censorship of pro-Palestinian voices. Uh, shadow banning has become an issue. Hundreds of complaints um, by users of social media since October talking about shadow banning on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you name it, right? This is, this is an issue going on worldwide. Yes, in the United States, much of the censorship against people who are seeking to defend the human rights of Palestinians or seeking to criticize the state of Israel, especially their military's actions in Gaza, um, alleging or describing it as either genocidal or at the very least multiple war crimes of ethnic cleansing, um, collective punishment, starvation, dehydration. And those individuals are often censored at universities they're often fired from their workplaces, and they're often experiencing um, various forms of censorship, even in their own private lives. What we're not seeing as much of yet is the U.S. government uh, censoring them, except that we've seen in Congress just recently resolutions that incorrectly conflate or define anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism as an explicit attempt to censor and criminalize any criticism of the state of Israel. Uh, and also, of course, we're seeing censorship on social media, but that is controlled primarily by private companies, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and other uh, social media companies. What is it that social media users can do when, as I said, some of this is taking place not so overtly? Uh, a case in point, a Belgian filmmaker, Thomas Maddens, noticing sudden decrease in engagement with his with a TikTok video he'd posted. And you're not always notified. It's it's a, an algorithm, we're told, that will suppress engagement, and you might not even know it. Yeah, well, I just want to emphasize that in the United States, there's two types of censorship, and the most visible high profile and can be even the most harmful to people's uh, material lives, their work, their ability to be in school, and also their ability to be safe, has been in the physical real world, where students and private individuals, workers are getting doxxed, uh, they're getting assaulted, they're being disciplined in schools, uh, universities, and oftentimes uh, assaulted when they protest. And in some cases, even government agencies, whether it's state, local, or federal, are trying to either stop them from protesting altogether or really restrain them. So that, that is very real and has become a means of silencing the mass movement that has been growing in the United States. And it's unprecedented because the United States media and the government has been explicitly pro-Israeli and anti-Palestinian. Now, when it comes to the social media, it's really based on the analytics, and it's just every individual or user has bears the burden of trying to determine whether their posts are actually being viewed and also whether they're being deleted. But again, there's very little legal remedy because it's a private company, it's not state action, and the First Amendment does not apply to private companies. So it's difficult to, to get them to, to stop if the public relations is actually in support of censorship of Palestinians. And I just want to know one other really important fact is most of the people who are censored are Muslims, Arabs, South Asians, Palestinians. And so there is an issue of racism and discrimination that's going on. And we talk about this in our report, presumptively anti-Semitic, Islamophobic tropes in the Palestine-Israel discourse uh, that we published with the Center for Security, Race, and Rights. And it shows very clearly that People, private companies, the government, the teachers, uh, employers believe that they're justified in censoring Muslims, Arabs, and South Asians because they believe that they're anti-Semitic. They believe that Islam and Muslims teaches people to hate Jews, which is false. And so they want to reframe the issue from a political issue, from a dispute over land and displacement and war crimes to a religious holy war. And that is not what the vast majority of advocates for human rights in, pa in Palestine uh, believe the issue to be.
And as you're talking, I just point out to viewers, we're looking at pictures coming in from Burlington, Virginia. You might recall the uh, story you. of uh, Vermont, sorry, where um, uh, Palestinian uh, uh, students were attacked. That's one of them who was, is now being released from hospital. I, I guess it underscores the very real life, and that's Hisham Awartani, I should point out. It underscores the very real life consequences that you are referring to. This isn't just happening on social media. The Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, for example, receiving more than 2,000 requests for help and reports of bias in just 57 days, it says. Is this creating a new norm for Islamophobia, for suppression of minorities now? Well, it's a continuation of what we've been seeing for the last 22 years. I, I wrote an entire book about this, The Racial Muslim, When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom, which is how Islamophobia after 9-11 became normalized and mainstreamed. And what we're seeing is an expansion of Islamophobia to not just include people who are Muslim, Arab, and South Asian, but also to include people within those communities who defend the, the rights of Palestinians or who just criticize the human rights violations of Israel. And remember, these are the same people who also criticize the human rights violations of Arab and Muslim-majority countries, and they usually receive rewards for that type of human rights advocacy. But when they, uh, when they direct their human rights advocacy to Israel, suddenly they're slandered and defamed as hateful and anti-Semitic. So it goes to show that this is really about um, racism, and it's uh, against these communities, and it's also about censorship. And I can't think of anything more anti-American than not allowing for the free flow of debate and discussion about an issue in which our government in the United States funds the state $3.8 billion to Israel's military, and Biden just now asked Congress for $10 billion more. So this is exactly what we should be discussing and debating both sides of the issue, but what you're seeing is the media, politicians, universities, workplaces, and social media, they only want the pro-Palestinian perspective to be uh, expressed. All right. Thanks so much for your analysis on that, Sahar Aziz.